Now for the news in detail, we'll begin in the U.S., where the daily death count from the new coronavirus has dropped to under 1,200 for the second consecutive day. Worldwide, the deaths have crossed 211,000, with over 3 million people infected. This report has the details. The number of new cases and deaths from the coronavirus is starting to decline in most of the hard-hit countries. U.S. President Donald Trump says he will consider easing travel restrictions on Europe, depending how the continent responds to COVID-19. He says he foresees schools soon welcoming students back as the U.S. states begin to ease lockdown restrictions. We continue to see encouraging signs of progress. Cases in New York area, New Orleans, Detroit, Boston, and Houston are declining. Denver, Seattle, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Nashville, Indianapolis, and St. Louis are all stable and declining. All parts of the country are either in good shape, getting better. Elsewhere, Australia's most populous state of Sydney has relaxed some restrictions on movement and open beaches. New Zealanders also queued for fast food takeaway after being freed from a month-long lockdown. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern advised people to limit non-essential travel, shifting the coronavirus alert level down a notch. With more people going back to work today, we need to be even more vigilant at level three to prevent any inadvertent spreading of the virus. We must continue to stay home where possible, including for work and education. Please stay regional and limit non-essential travel. And even though you can expand your bubble, keep it as small as possible and exclusive. Meanwhile, Russia has overtaken China and the number of infections as its tally climbed over 87,000. China's northwestern Shaanxi province reported 20 new imported cases, saying the patients had arrived from Moscow. Pakistan has recorded its highest number of daily deaths from the new coronavirus as 20 people lost their lives overnight. The death toll in the country has risen to 301, with over 14,000 infections. The health ministry said 3,233 people have so far recovered, while 111 patients are in critical condition. It said over 157,000 tests have been conducted across the country, with nearly 6,500 just in the last 24 hours. The National Disaster Management Authority said Pakistan will soon attain the capacity to conduct 40,000 tests per day. NDMA Chairman Lt. Gen. Mohammad Afzal confirmed this after receiving 18 tons of medical equipment from China. Kabul says the Taliban have killed four members of the Afghan National Police in an attack in the eastern Paktia province. Presidential spokesperson Dawa Khan Minapil said the group attacked the security personnel when they were breaking their fast. The Taliban have claimed responsibility for the attack. In a tweet, spokesperson Zabihullah Mujahid said the fighters killed one officer. Libya's military leader Khalifa Haftar has declared the 2015 UN-brokered political agreement invalid. In a televised address, Haftar said his national army would work to create conditions for building permanent civic institutions. Haftar also overthrew the Tobruk-based House of Representatives and the parallel government in eastern Libya. The military commander said his army is accepting the popular mandate to rule the country. By the choice of the Libyan people, the source of sovereignty, we announce that the general command is answering the will of the people. Despite the heavy burden and the many obligations and the size of the responsibility, and we will be subject to the people's wish in front of God. Well, the Government of National Accord has urged lawmakers of the Eastern Parliament to take its side after the Field Marshal's announcement. The call came after the GNA said it conducted five airstrikes on Haftar-controlled Alwatia Air Base. On to Somalia now, where the U.S. Africa Command has acknowledged two civilians were killed in an airstrike targeting militants in that country in 2019. Those findings were part of AFRICOM's first quarterly report on civilian casualties. AFRICOM said the airstrike on the 23rd of February last year also resulted in wounding three bystanders. In a press release, the command's head, General Stephen Townsend, said AFRICOM will admit its shortcomings openly. He said the killing was deeply regrettable and that the command has the deepest respect for the people of Somalia. The finding marks the second time AFRICOM has acknowledged civilian casualties resulting from U.S. strikes in Somalia.
The U.N. envoy to Yemen, Martin Griffith, has voiced concern over the declaration of self-rule by the Southern Transitional Council in Aden City. In a statement, Griffiths called for speeding up the implementation of the Riyadh Agreement with the support of the Saudi-led coalition. Griffiths said the latest turn of events is disappointing, especially when Aden and other areas in the south have yet to recover from flooding. The UN envoy said the Riyadh Agreement will deliver benefits to people in the south by improving public services and security. He said the stakeholders must put their differences aside and work for the Yemeni people. The Palestine Liberation Organization has briefed Sweden's foreign minister and Belgium's diplomat on Israel's illegal annexation plan. In a tweet, Secretary General Saeb Erekat said he held comprehensive telephone conversations with Anne Lind and Bernard Quintin. Erekat said he called for immediate halts of Israeli settlements in the West Bank. He urged the two officials to assert pressure on Israel to keep up with the UN's 1967 borders. On the 1st of July, the Israeli parliament will vote on the annexation of large swathes of the West Bank on the basis of the U.S. Middle East plan. The Arab League, meanwhile, says it will convene an urgent virtual meeting on Thursday over Israeli plans to annex parts of the occupied West Bank. The League's Deputy Secretary, Hossam Zaki, said Arab foreign ministers will discuss ways to support Palestine to help it confront Israel. Zaki said the ministers will discuss providing political, legal and financial support to the Palestinian leadership to confront the Israeli plans. It comes after Israeli leadership signed a deal for a unity government. The arrangement could accelerate Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's plans to annex parts of the West Bank in the coming months. In Lebanon, a protester was shot and killed during unrest in the northern city of Tripoli overnight. Demonstrators, angered at the plunging currency and inflation, clashed with security forces in defiance of a coronavirus lockdown. The 26-year-old protester's death was confirmed by his family. In a statement, the army said a firebomb was thrown at one of its vehicles in Tripoli. It added that a hand grenade was hurled at a patrol during rioting, injuring two others. The facades of several banks were smashed with at least one set on fire. The Banking Association declared all banks in Tripoli shut from today, saying banks had been targeted in riots. In the capital, Beirut, footage has showed protesters running from army officers as a wall of burning tires blocked the street. Turkey says its forces conducted the 6th Joint Patrol with Russian troops on a key highway in Syria's northwestern border. In a tweet, the Defense Ministry said troops from the two countries carried out land and aerial inspections in Idlib. The patrol exercises are part of an agreement brokered between Turkey and Russia on the 5th of March in Moscow. The presidents of both countries agreed to a ceasefire and military patrols to ensure the truce holds in the region. Turkey says it has killed two militants of the Kurdistan Workers' Party in airstrikes during a counter-terrorist operation in northern Iraq. The National Defense Ministry said the military carried out operations in Hakurk region. The ministry said Turkey will continue to destroy weapon caches and shelters used by the terrorists. It said over 400 Kurdish militants have been killed in northern Iraq over the past five months. Turkey holds the PKK responsible for the deaths of some 40,000 people in a 30-year conflict. The Iranian armed forces have warned that any provocative move by U.S. forces will be met with a powerful response. It said the presence of U.S. and its allies in West Asia, especially the Persian Gulf, has been the source of insecurity for regional countries. In a statement, Tehran said high-risk behaviors which make shipping in the region insecure have started since the U.S. arrival in the region. The forces reiterated Iran has never initiated and will never start any conflict in the region. They said in the case of any clashes, the U.S. forces and its allies will be responsible for instability in the Gulf. The armed forces advised the U.S. and its allies to abide by Iran's regulations as well as international laws. 
Well, Iran's President Hassan Rouhani has sought the help of his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping, in ending U.S. sanctions. In a telephone conversation, the two leaders discussed regional security, Tehran-Washington ties, and the fight against COVID-19. In a statement, Rouhani's office said U.S. curbs on Iran undermine security, peace, and stability. He said the security of the region and its waterways is important for Tehran, but Washington is making the Persian Gulf unstable. Meanwhile, China's state media said President Xi expressed condolences to the Iranian government over coronavirus while reaffirming their bilateral relationship. It said Xi vowed to strengthen collective preventive measures against the pandemic with Iran. I'll be back after this break with plenty more news. Stay tuned. Welcome back. The U.S. says it is probing if China could have stopped the spread of the novel coronavirus outbreak. Speaking to reporters at the White House, President Donald Trump said the virus could have been stopped at the source. Earlier, Trump warned Beijing of consequences, saying there was a big difference between a mistake that got out of control and something that was done deliberately. Trump says his administration is conducting serious investigations. A lot of ways you can hold them accountable. We're doing very serious investigations, as you probably know. And we are not happy with China. We are not happy with that whole situation because we believe it could have been stopped at the source. It could have been stopped quickly and it wouldn't have spread all over the world. And we think that should have happened. Uh, so we'll uh, let you know at the appropriate time. But we are doing serious investigations. Well, the BRICS Association, comprising of Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, will convene a video conference on coronavirus today. Russia will chair the meeting of foreign ministers who will analyze how the pandemic and its economic fallout is affecting international relations. In a statement, the Russian foreign ministry said top diplomats will exchange views on joint measures to combat COVID-19. It said the foreign ministers would exchange ideas to overcome the economic and social consequences of the pandemic. The meeting's participants will also touch upon the strategic partnership between the BRICS countries. Nearly 51 million people worldwide are internally displaced due to conflict or disaster with COVID-19 posing a new threat. In its report, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center says about 33.5 million displacements due to conflicts and disasters were recorded in 2019. It said the number of IDPs in 2019 was the highest annual figure since 2012. The report said last year, 8.5 million people were forced to abandon their homes due to conflict and violence. IDMC said the further 24.9 million people have been displaced by natural disasters such as earthquakes and floods in 2019. It said of the total 51 million IDPs in the world, nearly 46 million have been displaced due to violence and over 5 million as a result of natural disasters. In France, meanwhile, repair work has restarted at the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris after being paused due to the country's coronavirus lockdown. A fire engulfed the 850-year-old building on the banks of the River Seine on April 15th last year. Work is underway to make the site compliant with social distancing rules so work can properly resume. Officials say showers for workers will be modified and changing rooms adapted to reduce the risk of infection. The global coronavirus pandemic forced officials to delay the planned start of reconstruction on the 23rd of March. French President Emmanuel Macron has promised to rebuild within five years, but work so far has been slow. In Russia, doctors have observed significant improvements in coronavirus patients after transfusion of blood plasma from recovered people. In an interview, Moscow's deputy mayor, Anastasia Rakova, said doctors saw no health complications or side effects. Rakova said this kind of treatment is used only for patients in critical condition. Blood plasma transfusion is believed to be one of the most efficient measures to combat the disease in the absence of a vaccine. It is being widely used in the U.S., Germany, China and other countries. 
Over 20 major film festivals around the world have come together to stream free movies on YouTube. It comes after the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted many international events. In a statement, YouTube said it will host We Are One, a global film festival from the 29th of May. While the festival will stream for free, viewers will be asked to donate to the World Health Organization's COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund. The event feature content curated by Berlin, Cannes, Venice, Sundance, Toronto and Tribeca Film Festivals, among others. The event will include films, shorts, documentaries, music, comedy and conversations, and a full schedule will be available soon. Oil prices have crashed again, with U.S. WTI crude plummeting to under $11 per barrel from 20. British Petroleum has also taken a hit of over $4 billion in the first quarter of the year 2020. Prices dropped after the U.S. oil fund LP sold all of its WTI contracts. Meanwhile, Brent crude futures fell around 4% to trade at just over $19 a barrel. Risks on the demand side amid the COVID-19 pandemic fallout have reignited fears over the availability of storage capacities. U.S. oil prices have posted a record weekly loss of 32.3% based on the June contract. The U.K. has announced a new fast-track loan scheme with a 100% government-backed guarantee. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, made the announcement for small businesses battered by the economic fallout of COVID-19. Under the new scheme, small businesses can apply for bounce-back loans up to a maximum of £50,000 or 25% of their turnover. The government will pay the interest for the first 12 months on these loans. The loans will be easy to apply for through a short, standardized online application from Monday next week. So today we are announcing a new microloan scheme, providing a simple, quick, easy solution for those in need of smaller loans. Businesses will be able to apply for these new bounce back loans for 25% of their turnover, up to a maximum of £50,000, with the government paying the interest for the first 12 months. Well, according to the Treasury, British COVID-19 support schemes have provided over £15 billion for businesses in just a few weeks. Global e-commerce sales have surged by 8% from 2017 to hit over $25.5 trillion in 2018. At its e-week event, the UN's Conference on Trade and Development released the latest estimates. The body estimated the 2018 e-commerce sales value was equivalent to 30% of global GDP that year. It said about 1.5 billion people made purchases online in 2018. The trade body said the COVID-19 crisis has accelerated the uptake of digital solutions, tools and services. The trade body's director, Shamika Sirmani, said the overall impact on the value of e-commerce in 2020 is still hard to predict. European stock markets are trading higher as a slate of strong earning reports from companies outweigh a slump in oil prices. Frankfurt's DAX has gained over half a percent as Lufthansa stocks jumped more than 7.5% over a 9 billion euro government bailout. London's FTSE 100 and France's CAC 40 is trading nearly half a percent higher. In the UK, Europe's largest bank, HSBC, announced that its pre-tax profit fell 48% year-over-year in the first quarter of 2020. Oil giant BP reported a historic loss of over $4 billion in the first quarter. Bucking up, financial services giant UBS reported a 40% increase in its quarterly profit. In Asia, Hong Kong's Hang Seng closed over 1% higher, while the Shanghai Composite traded fractionally lower. Time to find out what the weather is like around the world.
for the latest updates on these and other stories, you can always follow us on our social media at Indus.news. Thanks for watching.